Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. In today's video I'm talking about all the books that I read in the first half of December. So we are rushing towards the end of the year and I am trying to get in as many things last minute as I can. I have to say so far this month has been a really good reading month. I've read a lot of things I've enjoyed quite a bit. I've read some new favorites which is exciting because I've been a little bit lower on those the last couple of months. Overall it's just been a really strong reading month so far so I have quite a few books to talk to you about today. In the first half of December I read 15 books. This does include a couple of graphic novels and like shorter works so we're going to talk about all of those and I had one DNF. If you're new to the way that I do these mid-month check-ins I talk about the books that I read in chronological order. At the end of the month I do wrap-ups where I talk about books from lowest rated to highest rated, but for today's video I'm just going to be talking about these in the order that I read them. Beginning with my one DNF. The book that I DNF'd is The Hawthorne School by Sylvie Perry. This was an audio review copy that I had from NetGalley and I got to about the 30% mark I believe before DNFing it. So this is pitched as kind of a gothic thriller about a single mom who sends her difficult child to a school that she thinks is the answer for them but then weird stuff starts happening and I like I got to a point in this book where I was like I just like I can't I can't read from this character's perspective any longer which is unfortunate because I do think that the atmosphere of the school is creepy and there's a lot of really weird stuff going on which is interesting but this mom just completely oblivious to so many major red flags and at least for me as a parent of including of a you know like somewhat more challenging child around the same age as her child in the book uh I, I did not find it believable at all at all I was like no <laughs> no this is not remotely subtle like from the very moment that she goes to interview to check out the school there are major red flags and I'm like I just don't buy that that any halfway decent parent would go through this so yeah I don't know like I just I was like I can't I can't do this anymore so I liked the concept I do think the setting is interesting the setup of the school is interesting but it really needed a lot more subtlety in my opinion to make it creepy but in a way that the mom wouldn't obviously pick up on. It is a debut novel so part of it might just be that the author hasn't done this before and like made it way too obvious but yeah I idea enough to that one. The first book that I finished reading was Next Year in Havana by Chanel Clayton. This was a book chosen for me by one of my patrons to read and I liked it but I didn't love it. I had kind of mixed feelings about it. So it's a dual timeline story. Part of it is set in Havana, Cuba in 1958 and the other part is set in 2017 following the granddaughter of the other main character going to Cuba for the first time in her life to scatter her grandmother's ashes. And then the 1958 part is leading up to and during the Cuban Revolution, following the daughter of a wealthy family and kind of what happened. So what I like about this is the fact that it introduces you to quite a bit of the history of Cuba. It tries to talk about Cuban identity and how that becomes complicated when you are in diaspora and not living in Cuba for people who left during this time period and had the privilege to be able to do that. It, it tries to kind of grapple with that which is interesting. The romantic plots didn't really work for me especially the modern one. I wasn't a huge fan. We spend a lot of the the early time of them getting to know each other with her thinking that he's married even though he tur does turn out to be divorced so it's not like cheating but it's like it just feels kind of icky and I didn't find it super believable like their their relationship. So yeah mixed feelings on this one. I gave it three and a half stars. Thinking about it now this is really realistically probably more of like a three star read for me so I might go back and change that but there were things that I liked about it. I think it was interesting. I like the historical piece of it but wasn't a huge fan of the romance and yeah I don't know kind of a, a mixed bag for me. Then I read a holiday romance anthology. This is How the Duke Stole Christmas by Tessa Dare, Sarah McLean, Sophie Jordan, and Joanna Shoup. 
I really like the project of this book quite a lot. I think it's an interesting concept. All of the authors took inspiration from one of their favorite holiday movies and then turned it into a Regency romance. So if what you like in historical romance is believability and historical accuracy, that is definitely not what you're getting here, which I'm fine with. Like that in particular doesn't bother me. I. I, I don't really care. What do we have? We've got one that's like a Christmas Carol inspired, We've got one that's Home Alone inspired, one that's inspired by Little Women, um, I think one that's Miracle on 34th Street, so kind of a, a mix of things. And the stories themselves were a bit of a mixed bag for me. So the first three stories I would say that I liked but didn't love, they'd probably be in like the three and a half to four star range for me, but perfectly serviceable, enjoyable, kind of what I'm looking for from this kind of a holiday romance story. The fourth one I didn't like very much. I didn't like the power dynamics and didn't find the romance palatable or believable because it's a boss employee relationship set in a historical time period where you've got even more unevenness and power. I just I like uh, I don't like it. I didn't I I didn't I didn't like the fourth one. <laughs> So that one is Christmas in Central Park by Joanna Shoup. It's, I think, supposed to be kind of loose, loosely reimagining Miracle on 34th Street. But um, yeah, that one was definitely a miss for me. So as a whole, I ended up giving the collection three stars. I like the idea. I definitely enjoyed the first three stories. The fourth one, not so much. Then I read a book and I'm not going to say a ton about it here because I read this for a video project that should be coming out soon. But I read this because of Rachel over at Reads with Rachel. It's one of her favorite books of the year and she'd been like hyping it a lot. And so I finally read Iron Widow by Shirin J. Zhao and I freaking loved it. Loved it. It was so good. Um, this was absolutely my jam. I get why there might be a polarized response to this because this has a thing that I love that a lot of people don't like, which is a prickly unlikable heroine. She's not like she's not nice and she's not meant to be likable but I love that. I really enjoy that in my heroines. Some people do not but I was a huge fan of this. I thought it was fascinating the way that she blended actual history like Chinese history with futuristic sci-fi technology and like mecha robots and this kind of like sci-fi slash fantasy magic system except maybe it's technology not magic but it feels kind of magic-y. It's really cool. It's really cool and I loved it. It's also polyamorous. There's a love triangle but they don't choose. They just all are together and it's great. It does deal with a lot of really intense hard-hitting topics so if you need content warnings check them out. I do have them in my Goodreads review and my Goodreads is always linked down below if you want to see that. But yeah this was so good. It was so good. I I really enjoyed it. I'm very excited for book two. The Yeah and, and also I will say this if you are not a big YA reader but the premise of this sounds interesting, give it a try because it reads very much like crossover. It would not have been hard for her to have just aged up the characters by a couple of years and made it a little bit spicier and sold it for an adult audience. Like this doesn't read like it's particularly directed at teenagers in that kind of way. Like teenagers can read it but it's not. Anyway, it has a lot of crossover appeal so give it a try. I. <laughs> I really loved it. So if you couldn't tell, I did give this book six stars, which in my personal rating scale is what I give to a favorite of the year. This is definitely a new favorite for me. I, yeah, I'm, I'm very pleased. Loved it. Then I read Winterset Hollow by Jonathan Edward Durham. This was sent to me for review from the author. So thank you to the author for sending that. I, I'm gonna say this. This was a good reminder to me as to why I usually say no to debut novels from indie authors because I don't feel like I can often give glowing reviews to them and I kind of took a chance on this and that's where we're landing. It wasn't all bad, there were things that I liked a lot about it, but I think you can definitely tell it's a first novel, it is indie self-published, and I also have some like conceptual critiques of what this story is trying to do that I, I don't think it's actually doing in the way it's meant to. So here's what's difficult about this book. 
some of the criticisms that I have of it are super spoilery and so I can't get into talking about those in detail here. I do have a spoiler section of my Goodreads review where I give spoiler warnings and then I kind of get into the details of some of what happens in the plot and what happens at the end of the book and how that ties into the thematic content and why I have some 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 crit crit critiques of the, the way some things were handled. Uh, what can I say about this? Okay, so first up, I should tell you what it is. This is a dark fantasy horror novel following a group of friends who go on a trip to the place that inspired their favorite book from childhood with these like animal characters. But when they get there, things turn very dark and maybe it wasn't just fiction after all. So it's interesting. It turns into almost like a slasher genre horror novel eventually. It's a little bit of a slow burn. I, I What I love about this is the atmosphere and the setting. The detailed way that he writes the setting is so good and creepy and like builds tension that I thought really was done really well. The characterization is pretty good. I mean, you can kind of tell it's a de from a debut author, but like I didn't have a ton of complaints about it. And I think for an indie, it's like done reasonably well. The writing itself is a little bit mixed. It does feel a bit overwritten, which I think is something that you tend to see in debut self-published works from certain writers where it like is overly descriptive, using a higher level vocabulary when it's not necessary. And it just makes it difficult to really get into the flow of the story. And it, I think it could be more readable if it, that part of it was edited. It has potential, like there are parts of it that are really beautifully written and feel lyrical. It just needed to be done in a little bit more moderation, in my opinion, for the genre that it's, it's writing in. So that was my feeling about the writing. Uh, thematically, what can I say that's not spoilery? So I think thematically this book is trying to say something about colonization and the treatment of indigenous people, but I don't think it does that well. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it ends up, instead of doing what I think it's trying to do, it ends up really centering the narrative of the colonizer in a way that I think is potentially harmful. So I don't feel like that was the intent of the author, but given the way the end of the book goes and all of the things that happen, that's kind of what it ends up being. So. Uh, yeah, I ended up giving this book three stars. I do think it is a very ambitious debut. I think there's a lot of promise here. I would be interested in reading something else from this author in the future because there was a lot conceptually that I loved here. And the way that the the setting and the atmosphere was done was just like, oh, it was it was it was very good. It was very creepy. There's a lot of content warnings here. Like this, it's 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 not a light book. It's definitely horror. So I wanted to love this more than I did. I, and, and I think this is reinforcing to me that I, I really, really do need to do better about sticking to my rule about not accepting for review debut indie authors, because <laughs> I've been pretty good about implementing that, that most of the time. This one, I think the premise was just so intriguing to me, and the fact that it had been nominated for a Bram Stoker Award, I was like, well, like, it sounds really cool. And it is, like, it is promising, but, you know, it's hard with an indie book. I want to be able to give it a glowing review, and in this case, I can't. But I do think there are some people who are still gonna really like this. Um, yeah, anyway, so who knows? Maybe my review will make you more interested in picking it up, but I did give this three stars. Thank you to the author for sending it, and, uh, sounds of interest, you could check it out. Next, I read Better Off Wed by Susanna Craig. This is a historical romantic suspense. It's the third book in a series that I've generally really enjoyed. And I have this for review from NetGalley. I've got to say this isn't my favorite book in the series. I did still like it and I like the concept of it, but I probably preferred the first two books in the series. 
The premise is fun though. The heroine in this is secretly an avenging angel who steals from predatory men and gives what she steals to the women that they leave in their wake, like pregnant and with nothing, so maybe like maids or whatever. And I, I really like her. I really like that. I think that's really fun. The hero is part of this spy organization that we know about from earlier in the series and he sent to try to recruit her to their cause and some things happen and they end up yeah I yeah I don't want to give too much away about this but it's fun it's a romantic suspense it's historical my my main complaint with this is that partway into the story our heroine sustains an injury to her ankle and it makes her a much more passive character through much of the book because she's recovering from it than I would have liked her to be. So I didn't I didn't love that in the way that I've I think I've loved earlier books in the series. I still liked it. I think it's fun. I think if you're looking for this kind of a genre where you have these great heroines and like I, I always like the the heroes in these books as well. They're wonderful and like happy to have these strong women at their sides. It's great. Uh, I did give this one four stars. So even though it's not my favorite book in the series, I did still really like it. Next, I read Witchmark by C.L. Polk. This is the Blades and Bodice Rippers book club pick for this month. We actually have a second one. We kind of last minute decided to add on and the other one I had read a couple months back. So the other one is uh, Marvelous Light. And actually, if you want to join us Boxing Day, uh, December 20th, 26th. We're going to be on my channel talking about these books, but this is a historical fantasy romance. It's set in an alternate Edwardian England where magic exists, and there was a lot that I really liked about this. It's a bit of a slow burn. It took a while for me to really fully get into the story, but once I did, I was hooked. I would definitely read on in the series. I definitely want to read more from this author. The main character we're following here is a doctor who has some magical abilities, but he's in hiding from his powerful family because the way that magic works in this England is that only magicians with a certain type of power are highly prized. Any magicians with a different kind of power are sort of blood bound to them and they're used almost like batteries for the, the power of, of these other mages. And so he has sort of run away, he's in hiding from his family, but his sister tracks him down and wants him to bind with her. And um, meanwhile, there's kind of a murder mystery plot going on. I just, I really liked this a lot. I think it is chilling the way that it ends. And one thing that I do think is interesting about this book is for the time period that's set in, it does a good job of somewhat, not fully, but somewhat reckoning with the impact of co colonization and empire in some interesting ways. So yeah, so there's all of that, but there's also a romance with a fey man. It's like a, a male male romance. And I really liked that. It's slightly steamy. I, I thought this was very good. I gave it four stars. It did take me a little while to get into the story. It wasn't like a perfect book for me, but very good. By the end, I was super into it and I would definitely read more from this author in the future. So it was a win for me. Then I decided to read a couple of graphic novels that have been sitting on my shelves. First up, I read Jellia by Junie Ba. This I picked up a copy of earlier this year. I heard about it from Jocelyn at Yogi with a Book and was like, because she was on my podcast and mentioned it. And I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. It is a West African fantasy epic. I would actually call this sci fantasy. It's kind of blending fantasy and sci-fi elements and I really liked it a lot. I thought it was super interesting. It's set in Africa. There's this like tower and there's villains and I don't, I don't want to like give too much away because these don't take that long to read but I was very into this. There's a lot of pretty detailed world building and you do have to read it pretty closely to follow the different plot threads and follow what exactly is happening in the story. But I really loved it. And then at the end, it's kind of cool because there's information about the folklore, about some of the Adinkra symbols that it's that it's using. There um, says from the peoples of Ghana and the Ivory Coast. So that's kind of cool. And it uses that throughout the book. And yeah, I just like this was really interesting. And I think that the story told here is loosely inspired by a tale from West African mythology. I'm not sure exactly 
what I think it talks about it somewhere in here but I gave it five stars I thought it was great I would definitely read more from this creator in the future then I read A Gift for a Ghost by Borja Gonzalez this um was a little bit more of a mixed bag this is one of these like books I had picked up uh, an arc of years back at a convention I went to I have like so a few sitting on my shelves that I just haven't gotten to so it's it's a little old but um it went on sale last year yeah I don't know this is the 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 idea is interesting so we've got one timeline set in 1856 where there's a girl who is like writing horror poetry and stuff instead of like being the lady she's supposed to be and then set in like modern era 2016 in 2016 there's like three teen girls who want to start a punk band and there's some like stuff between dimensions or timelines or whatever it's like I like the ideas and I like parts of it but the it's confusing the, the ending doesn't make a ton of sense and I just wanted a little bit more from it so I liked it but I didn't love it I gave it three stars then I read another e-arc that I had for review from Neck Alley this is called African Town by Irene Latham and Charles Waters it's a historical fiction novel in verse that's pretty interesting it's telling a story that I didn't know much about and I think it may be the first book talking about the the story of these people but it's why historical fiction that is recounting the experiences of the last enslaved people who were brought over from Africa illegally when they nobody else was supposed to be brought over and how they eventually founded this place called African Town which still exists as Africa Town in Alabama and was founded by these formerly enslaved people so it is intense in terms of the subject matter there's a lot of really traumatic content because it follows them from being in Africa, being captured and sold and brought over and all of the things that they went through. And yeah, there's content warnings in my Goodreads review if you need them. And one thing that is a little interesting about this, and I think people have mixed feelings on it, is that you do get the perspective of some of the enslavers in this as well, and the people who were a part of this voyage and of making this happen. And yeah, it's interesting. I do think it's an inspiring story in some ways. They show so much resilience in what they go through and what they're able to build in the community that they create after the Civil War ends. But it is intense. The subject matter is a lot. And yeah, I've seen an interesting review that I link in my Goodreads review from a Black reviewer that might be worth reading, questioning the fact that it's a multiracial team that wrote this book so it's a white woman and a black man working together and I guess they've worked together on other projects in the past but I think this reviewer was questioning whether you know a white woman was the person to tell the story so there's a lot of questions about it but I do think it's an important story to have out there and I could see this being a great text for teachers who want to talk about the time period or talk about different elements of the story so a little bit of a mixed bag there but I think it's fairly well written it's easy to read it's very accessible which is another reason why I could see this being really good in the classroom because it it's not difficult to get into I ended up giving this book four stars then I read an e-arc of Where the Drowned Girls Go by Seanan McGuire this is the I think seventh book in the Wayward Children series coming out in early January so no, not too much longer to wait I freaking loved it I think this is one of the best installments in the series I love the series as a whole but this one was really really cool and interesting it primarily follows Cora and a lot of the thematic content here is talking about fat phobia which is just done beautifully I loved the way that it handled that I also like the fact that this is kind of opening up the world of the Wayward Children series we spend a lot of time in this book in kind of the sisters the sister school to school for Wayward Children and it's like it's it's dark we're evil twin and that's really interesting another thing is that this book connects us to the main character from the last installment from last year across the grass green fields or across the green grass fields that character shows up in this new school so that's kind of cool I just love this this was fantastic for me everything I wanted it to be uh, one of my favorite books that I've read this year so I also gave this one six stars so it's a favorite of the year I know it's not coming out until next year but definitely would look forward to this if you're a fan of the wayward children series i'm telling you you're probably gonna love this installment 
I did anyway. The next book that I read is another one for that video project that I have coming. So again, I'm not going to say a ton about this. And this is another one that actually that is kind of hard to talk about without spoilers. I, I feel like I have a few of those, honestly, in, in, in this video. But I read The Book of Accidents by Chuck Wendig. This is very interesting. And I'm, I'm still kind of thinking about it and just trying to decide how I totally feel about it. So this is literary horror that's a bit of a genre bender. I don't want to say too much about that. One thing that's interesting about this is that around halfway through the book, some major things shift. There's a big tonal shift and it did not go the direction I was expecting. And I, I have mixed feelings about the direction it took. I see why it did it. And there were things that I think are really interesting about the choices that this made. I don't think it was quite what I was expecting or looking for from this book, but I don't dislike it. And I, this is the kind of book that I could see if I went back and reread it, liking it better, knowing where it was going to go. So this is an interesting take on a family moves into maybe a haunted house story. Thematically, this is really a book about generational trauma and abuse. And it is intense. It is horror. It does get quite gory. It also deals with some graphic versions of those main topics that it's it's getting into. I think it handles the topics pretty well. Thematically, I think this is really interesting. There was a lot that I really liked about the writing itself, although I think this book is too long. Like it's over 500 pages. I don't think it needs to be that long. This really could have been shortened. But this makes me interested to pick up some other things by Chuck Wendig. This is the first thing I've read from him. And I, I liked the way he did characterization. I liked a lot of the way that he did his writing. And this is definitely eerie and atmospheric. It's set in small town Pennsylvania and weird stuff is going down. I, I don't want to say too much more than that, but I did really like this. I think I landed on four stars for it. Although the more I think about it, the more I think maybe this is like a four and a half star book. I, I gotta think about it. The more I think about it, the more I like it, which, which is a good sign. So happy to say I enjoyed this. It was very interesting. Then I read another e-arc from NetGalley. This is for Shattered Midnight by Danielle Clayton. It's another January release. This is the second book in a series coming out from Disney, a YA fantasy series that's kind of interesting. The first installment was um, A Broken Wish by Julie C. Dow. This is set farther in the future. So A Broken Wish is set, I think, like late 1800s in Germany. This book is set in 1920s New Orleans. And then there's going to be two more books in the series, each from a different YA author set further in the timeline um, as we go forward. It's kind of following like a family curse. I really loved this. I think if you like Danielle Clayton's writing, you're going to enjoy it. If you like her kind of lush descriptions, her messy characters, and if you want something that's going to really give you those vibes of New Orleans food and jazz. It, it does such a good job of evoking that sense. And I really liked our heroine. She's been sent down to New Orleans to live with her aunt after her magic kind of got her into trouble. But she's still in New Orleans sneaking out at night to go perform in jazz clubs and ends up in a forbidden romance with a white boy piano player that she meets. And one thing that I think is interesting about this book is it does a good job of pretty realistically laying out why that kind of an interracial relationship would be incredibly dangerous, especially during that time period. It's not made light of like you really see why that is, which which I think I think is handled well. And the other thing that's kind of interesting about this is while her aunt does some horrible things, it really walks the line where you understand why and you understand where she's coming from and that she wants the best for her niece, even if she has kind of twisted ways of going about trying to make that happen. So I really liked it. I gave this one four and a half stars. And I think if you like Danielle Clayton, if you like her writing, you're probably going to enjoy this as well. I think she did a great job with it. The next book is the last one I've read so far for this video project that is coming. And it is the other one that I like can't talk much about because of spoilers. Um, but I read The Other Black Girl by Zakia Delilah Harris. This is another one with a unlikable heroine in a different sort of way. And it's interesting to me reading the reviews because man, this is a polarizing book. I loved it. I'm just gonna say I, 
I loved this book and I think what it's doing is so interesting. A lot of people didn't and for a variety of reasons. Some people because they didn't like the main character, which I don't think you're supposed to like her to be honest. Like I think that's intentional, but I, I think there are people who need to be rooting for their main character or like the main character for a book to work for them. So what is this book? It's a little, again, like without spoilers, it's really hard to talk about. This is a quiet literary horror. It's very slow burn. It's not super graphic, never super graphic, but it is definitely a horror novel. And it was not what I was expecting. Like, if you start reading it, and you think you know where it's going, like, you probably like, you don't know where it's going. This is so interesting. Like the ending was, was uh, bold, I guess a lot of people hated the ending, but I, I thought it was it was an interesting ending. In some ways, this is a commentary on black identity, especially in the workplace, about microaggressions, respectability politics. It's a very interesting book that is Pur purposefully, what's the word I'm looking for? Purposefully being controversial. It's following a young black woman who is working as an assistant editor for a well-known publishing house. And she is the only black girl on the editorial staff until they hire a new girl, which she's initially excited about until she starts to feel sort of like, oh, well, maybe this other girl is like, like, better at being black than me, like am I black enough kind of thing, but then it goes some really interesting places. So I'm not going to say any more than that because I don't want to spoil things, but I do think this one is worth reading. It's also one that I gave six stars to. I, I have had a great first half of the month, guys. I am thrilled <laughs> to have like three new favorites to add to my list. It's really exciting. So yeah, uh, a controversial one, but I, I really liked it. Two more books to talk about. First up, I read Diary of a Young Naturalist by Dara McNulty. This was sent to me for a review from the publisher, so thank you to them. It's a really interesting book. It's not super long, but it actually did take me quite a while to read just because of the type of writing it is. I am floored that this was written by a 14 year old. Like, that is wild to me. This was written by a 14 year old kid who lives in Ireland and is autistic and is a naturalist. He loves nature, creatures, plants, and is an activist for them and wrote this book and it's written as diary entries through the following him through a year of interacting with the nature around him, also spending time with his family, getting involved in activism, dealing with bullying, moving to a new home, uh, kind of like his life as a teenager, but then a lot of descriptions of like nature and animals and stuff. And what I think is interesting about this book is that at the beginning I was like, okay, I'm more interested in the stuff about him and his sort of life and experience than these nature descriptions, just because it's not a genre that I typically gravitate towards. But by the end, I just like his writing is so beautiful and lyrical and his passion for the natural world just makes you want to be excited about it too, which I think is very, very cool. So I think this is such an impressive first book. And I also love the fact that he pretty openly shares his experience of dealing with the world as an autistic teenager and what that's like. And coming from a family of mostly autistic people, his mom, his younger brother, and his younger sister are all, are all autistic as well. And he talks quite a bit about that. I, I think this is great. I think everybody should go read it. It's really, really good. I ended up giving this one four and a half stars. Thank you so much to the publisher for sending a copy. And the final book that I read in the first half of the month is Mangoes and Mistletoe by Adriana Herrera. This is a holiday romance novella and our pick for Patreon book club for the month. I loved this. I really like Adriana Herrera. She's become one of my favorite romance authors. I know what I'm getting from her and I just always like her books. This one is a sapphic romance. It's two women who are competing on a TV show baking competition in Scotland. They're both from the Dominican Republic. There's kind of a grumpy sunshine plot. It does get quite steamy as well. And I just really enjoyed this. Also the food descriptions made me so hungry. I, I will say I think if you are the kind of person who doesn't do well with novellas in general because you need a longer lead up to characters being together. This might not work for you. It, it is 
you know, it's short, but that doesn't bother me. I loved it. I gave it five stars. This was exactly what I wanted it to be. And it was, it was great. It was perfect. Perfection for me. So there you go. Those are all of the books that I read in the first half of the month. Like, did I not say it's been a fantastic first half of the reading month, which is exciting, because honestly, the last three months or so haven't been as good. I've had a lot fewer favorites. I've read a lot of like fine books, but some major disappointments. And so it's really nice to be heading towards the end of the year so strongly with so many books that I'm really enjoying. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything I talked about in this video. And for your question of the day, tell me how your reading is going for this last month of the year. Are you reading more? Are you reading less? Are you finding some new favorites? Where are you at? What are you, what are you picking up these days and how's it going? Let me know in the comments down below. If you guys like this video, it helps if you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you all so much for watching and I will see you next time.